Welcome to the All In Recruitment Podcast by Manatal, where we explore best practices, learnings and trends with leaders in the recruitment space. If you like our content, please subscribe to our channels on YouTube and Spotify to stay tuned for our weekly episodes. My name is Lydia and joining us today is Stephen Rothberg, founder of College Recruiter, a job search site. Hello, Stephen. Thank you for joining us on this podcast. It is a pleasure, Lydia. Thank you for having me. So, Stephen, you've been in this space for over three decades now and, and having founded yeah. and run College Recruiter since 1991. That's right. Yeah. So the I was in grad school in the U.S. and where, where I live now in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and started a small business um, after about a year after I graduated. And over the course of a few years, it kind of evolved mm -hmm. from we were doing print publications like Campus Maps, Employment Magazines. And then it evolved into the job board. So, so yeah, it's, 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 it's 31 years, oh, which 30, is weird what? because I'm only, tw I'm only 28. Okay. So that's, <laughs> don't, don't know how that, don't know how that works. If we don't know where the time went, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and you've taken that, you know, as you said, you've taken that from the print era right up to where you are today. And, and you also do your podcast. So what got you yeah. interested? You mentioned a little bit, but what, really got you interested to stay in the college recruitment space back then? What's driven yeah. the evolution of this job site? Yeah, you know, it was definitely somewhat of, of a bit of an accident. So that mm. the very first publications um, that my little micro business um, was publishing were maps of college and university campuses. Mm. The revenues came from selling advertising around the borders of the maps. We gave the maps for free to the university. The university gave the maps for free to the student. And so all the revenues came in in a very tight little window in about eight weeks out of the year, just kind mm -hmm. of right before students went back to campus in the fall. And I was newly married and my wife and I were kind of looking, you know, how do we expand the business? She wasn't working in the business, but she had a really good um, business head. And we were asking ourselves, how do we expand the business? And when we looked at what the strengths of the business were, it wasn't cartography. It wasn't publishing maps. What it was, was helping organizations reach college and university students. Mm. And so then we started to ask ourselves the question, well, what other publications might be helpful to that audience? And students who are arriving on campus first year or in some areas of the world, they call them freshmen or freshers they need to find their way around campus. They need to know where the restaurants are, where the apartments are. So a map is a really good thing for them. By the time you graduate four years later, mm -hmm. you know where all that is. Nobody's using a map anymore, but what they do need are jobs. Mm -hmm. And so we created a magazine called College Recruiter. And the name of the magazine came from the most common job title of the person in the HR department, or now we often have talent acquisition departments, but that was the job title of the person who was usually in charge of recruiting students and recent grads to work for those companies. The magazine first came out in 94 by 96. It, we had four different regionalized versions across the US at about 250 schools. And then this thing called the internet um, came along. And so we added a website, not because we thought it was going to be the future of the business, but because you probably know the expression, like the sizzle that helps sell the steak. You know, if you go into a restaurant and the table next to you, some somebody orders a steak and it comes out to them and you hear the snapping and crackling and the smoke coming off, you're probably going to order a steak too, unless they're a vegetarian. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but um, the, the internet at that time, a lot of people still thought it was a fad. We added mm -hmm. the website and one thing kind of led to another. And by 2000, we had closed off the print magazines, shut them down. They were profitable, but it, they were holding us back. Mm -hmm. um, and so by 2000, we were all in on the job search site. And we've had... Um, since 1996, when the first version of the job site went live, we've had seven different versions of it. Not pivots, but just sort of major evolutions. And, and job boards overall everywhere have, have transformed. And, and as you said, they keep evolving. So what would you say in your yeah. experience, maybe a few major challenges in the past maybe 10, 20 years? Yeah, you know, the basic business of a job board has always been to connect candidates mm -hmm with employers. So 
at a very high level, they're the same. How they do that has radically changed. There are definitely people out there who say, you know, oh, job boards haven't evolved and they haven't changed and and whatever, and they're just wrong um, because the, the the technology, the effectiveness, the accountability is light years ahead of of where it used to be. What you see increasingly started in the U.S., spread somewhat to Canada, more to the U.K., and it's now with some changes happening at Indeed to their pricing model. You're going to see a, a revolution, not an evolution, um, over the next mm -hmm. year of job boards being compensated based upon their performance. So rather than running an ad for 30 days and getting paid the same amount of money, whether that ad works or not, employers very soon are going to be paying for results. Mm -hmm. If the ad worked, they pay and they're happy to pay because, hey, if you hire people, it's cheap. If you don't hire people, no matter how little that job board charges you, it's too much money. And what's what I'm excited about, what's really about to change globally, is that job boards are going to be much more aligned to their employer customers. If the customer succeeds, so will the job board. And if the customer fails, if the ad does not generate results, then the job board's going to suffer too. And I think that's going to lead to much better re results for everyone. In, in your tagline, college recruiter, it says mm -hmm. that every student and recent grad deserves a great career. Has mm -hmm. your tagline or mission uh, seen any changes or has it, has it also evolved together with your job site? Yeah, we didn't really have a mission statement, a mantra, a tagline, a slogan hmm. until about... I think it was roughly six or seven years ago. And that was the time when we started to look at how we were managing our business, um, how we were planning, how we were assigning responsibilities. And by that time, my wife had long since joined the business. She had become the CEO. And a good friend of hers told her about um, the uh, something called the Entrepreneur's Operating System. Um, people often know it by the acronym EOS. And there's a book um, by Gina Wickman. I don't get a commission for selling it if mm -hmm. anybody buys it. It's about $15 on Amazon. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's called Traction, uh, Get a Grip on Your Business. And basically what the book does is it creates this whole framework or model or guide for how to manage your business, how to structure accountabilities, who's responsible for what, how to run meetings, how to do financial forecasts, and how to write your business plan. And part of that business plan is a mission statement. So that's when we really sat down for the first time and really created one. Mm -hmm. And we struggled with it. We were doing a bunch of things that really didn't fit into the business, but they were bringing in good money. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, why not do this? It brings in good money. And we saw a video um, on YouTube um, by this incredibly gifted speaker, um, Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. Uh, -E yeah. And he has this video, I'm sure there are actually a bunch of them on, I think it's called like the power of why or something mm -hmm. like that. Oh, that's right. And his premise is, that customers buy from you, not because of the functionality or price of your product, but because of the way it makes them feel. They buy from you because of the why. They believe in your mission. They believe in what they do. Mm -hmm. So you want to create an emotional attachment, which is the, we believe every student in recent grad deserves a great career. Who can say no to that? And then you give them rational reasons to justify that emotional buying decision. That's where your product actually comes into play, your price, your service, et cetera. So you have to back up the mission. You can't just have a good mission statement and expect you know, the world to, to beat a, a path to your door. But that's where it came from. We have not changed that mission statement at all. Every word, every character, everything about it is the same. Everybody in the company, when they join us, they get this really nice coffee mug. It has our logo on one side. It has our mission statement on another. We literally talk about that 
every day and every strategic decision that we make comes back to, is this helping students and recent grads find a great career? And if it doesn't, we don't do it. We've turned away loads of business that just doesn't fit. So, you know, if you've got an employer who wants to pay us to, to advertise jobs that are targeted to people with 10 plus years of experience, we're going to say no, regardless of how much they want to pay us. It's not what we do. And as you said, you articulate this every every opportunity that you get, every strategic meeting and also with your employees. Mm -hmm. and there must be lots of success stories even uh, to to illustrate this mission statement, right? So do you have any that you'd like to share uh, success stories, sure. especially around finding the right talent across these years? Yeah, a, a few come to mind. Um, so probably six, seven, eight years ago, um, one of our um, biggest clients was using one of our products that we call a targeted email campaigns. Basically, we'll deliver an email on behalf of employers to a really highly targeted group of people. So we can email female accounting majors who are in their fourth year or graduated within the last two at these 57 schools, and they all have to be U.S. citizens and speak Farsi. You know, some something really, really targeted. We can do that. We can do that at scale. We typically turn those around in a few days and got a call from the customer. It was a one of the biggest um, chip manufacturers in the world. And the customer was kind of upset because the performance of those email campaigns wasn't nearly as good as what she was used to. She was spending about $10,000 a quarter on these emails. And her target audience were female electrical engineering majors across the US. It was a very underrepresented group within their company, as, as you can imagine, it's very male dominated. And uh, so her complaint was that they only hired 200 people from it. Well, hiring 200 female electrical engineers for 10 grand is not something you should be crying about. That is something you should be celebrating. She was used to hiring four or 500. So she was wondering, like, why did the performance drop off so much? Well, we did figure it out. There were some changes that don't really matter for the sake of this discussion, but, but that was really awesome. It's really mm -hmm. nice to see when you do a campaign like that, you don't really know how many of those candidates are really interested. You, you know numbers, how many open the email, you know how many click to the employer's website. At that point, you lose visibility mm -hmm. and the employer tends not to share that data with you. So you don't know how many applied. You don't know how many were interviewed. You don't know how many were hired. And when you don't know that, you don't really know what kind of an impact you had. But when you hear that 200 people found great jobs with this really awesome company, that's a day to celebrate. Another one was um, actually very recently, just, just a few weeks ago, one of our largest customers was incredibly transparent with us in terms of these are the ads we're running with you. Um, and this is where we're where else we're running them. These are your results. These are the results we're getting from your competitors. So we could see in terms of quantity, like how many candidates were we sending to this customer? We could see in terms of quality, how many were applying, how many were getting interviewed, et cetera. And they're providing that data to us on a daily basis, which gives us the opportunity to do a little bit of A-B testing. If we send candidates like this to this job, do more of them apply, do more of them get interviewed? And then we can send more of them, more of those candidates, fewer of the candidates that don't. So that was also really nice because we could see head to head against our competitors that our results were really good. And what was also encouraging was because the employer was sharing that data with us, we knew they're only going to get better. And uh, so those sorts of partnerships between employers and their media partners, a true partnership where there's real trust and sharing of data really leads to better results. And how long on average are these partnerships? How long do they last? Yeah, a customer, that customer, the second one that has been really transparent with sharing your mm -hmm. job data with us. I think we started to work with them about a year and a half ago. Um, one of the things that we do that's, it's not at all unique, but it's unusual 
is that almost all of our job posting customers are on subscription packages. Hmm. They buy a job posting package. Usually we charge on a pay-per-click basis. And those packages automatically renew month after month after month until the customer tells us to stop. So if there are any job boards that are listening to the podcast, do that. It's really fantastic. You get a very high renewal rate. Something like 96% of our customers renew month after month after month. So it becomes, and you would know this from Manitel, it's a SaaS model. Right. The software is a service model mm -hmm. and it makes your revenues very predictable. It changes the relationship between you and your customers from constantly having to sell to them to instead constantly serving them, servicing them. That's good. The customer wants to be serviced, not sold to. So that customer is pretty typical. They've been with us for, I would say, at least two years now or coming up on two years. But almost all of our customers renew month after month after month. When they don't, every once in a while, it's because we fired them. Um, they're not giving us enough jobs or the jobs aren't right for us um, or their budgets are just tiny and, and it just doesn't scale. And so we'll fire them. We'll do that a couple times a year. You know, hey, we're just not a good fit for you. Sometimes there'll be a hiring freeze. The company will get merged or acquired, uh, stuff like that. And of course, every once in a while, there's just a customer that we just don't do well with. Like mm -hmm. if, if, if one of your employer clients were to come to us tomorrow and say, hey, we're really struggling to hire long distance truck drivers. In the US, we call typically re reference them as CDL, commercial driver's license. We'd say no. We just, we fail miserably at that every single time. So please don't. What is a user base like? <laughs> yeah, we help about 12 million students and recent grads a year and we're global. So we have uh, English language postings in, I think something like 100 or 120 countries. Moving on to... Um... Talent acquisition, then how to strategize around college recruitment, et cetera. And you're you're in mm -hmm. this space where it's uh, for recruitment of fresh graduates and 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 students even. In your experience, your observations, how has the approach to TA in colleges maybe changed or evolved over the past decades? Have there been any practices that may have existed before that that don't not, that don't exist now? I would say that college and university recruitment in the industrialized world, which I personally am going to be more familiar with, mm -hmm. hardly changed from the 1950s until uh, 2020. And then COVID accelerated everything, as it did in so many industries. So in the 1950s, the typical company that was recruiting college grads would send recruiters or hiring managers to a bunch of college campuses. They might drive there. They might fly. They might take, take, might take a train. And they would go on campus and work through the career service office. They get a short list of students. Maybe they're going to interview, you know, 12 people today, you know, per recruiter and 24 in total over the next couple of days. And from that, they might want to have five go back to the office for interviews and then hire one. And sometimes that scales up. There might be 60 schools that they go to and kind of replicate that model. That existed for basically 70 years. And... Sure, there was some technology that improved things and you had some things like online career fairs and whatever, but the vast majority of college grads were hired by large organizations, Fortune 1000 kinds of organizations, and the vast majority of those in um, hired almost all of their candidates through on-campus recruitment. Hmm. COVID comes along. And COVID, amongst many other things, says, no, you can't come on campus. Campus is closed. We don't have students, professors, staff, anybody on campus. So if you're going to want to try to recruit our students, you're not going to do it in person. Figure it out. Most organizations actually did, um, to my surprise. They, they adapted. So things that they had been saying in 2019 were impossible suddenly became feasible and actually much more efficient and effective. So... Online career fairs became a lot more popular. Um, they discovered that Gen Z somehow is actually does use the internet, which means that they do see job postings on Indeed and LinkedIn and College Recruiter and other sites. And lo and behold, they apply to those job postings just like people with 10 years of experience do. 
And you can interview them by Zoom or by phone or exchange a bunch of emails, just like candidates with 10 years of experience. The fact that they went to school or maybe even were currently enrolled really should never have impacted how you hired them. But it hmm. just did. One of the reasons it did is that a lot of recruiters and hiring managers who do a lot of university recruiting had a vested interest in, in keeping the old model. The, the let's go out to a bunch of college campuses because it's fun. Mm. And so it wasn't in the best interest of the company. It definitely wasn't in the best interest of the candidate because they'd have to wait around for six months to, to have interview slots um, and maybe get hired. But it was in the best interest of literally maybe a thousand people. And so they kept this whole industry stuck in the 1950s because they love to go on campus and have fancy dinners and go to football games. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, that's kind of what it was what it was all about. As COVID has receded, what we're seeing is that a lot of these companies have just not returned to campus hmm. or they have returned. But instead of hiring, you know, a thousand students and 950 of them coming from on campus interviews, they're still hiring a thousand and a hundred of them will come through on campus. One of the surprises to a lot of these organizations is that when they diversified their hiring practices, when they started to advertise online and tap into a much greater cross-section of candidates, lo and behold, their candidate pool became much more diverse. Lo and behold, so did their applicant pool. So did the people they were interviewing. So did the people they were hiring. What they discovered was that advertising online, whether it's through our site or just about any other, allows them to hire a more diverse group of graduates. And that makes their workplace more productive. So when I was mentioning being more effective a little bit earlier, that's what I was referencing. Hmm. And and you mentioned Gen Z and also the, hmm. uh, you know, it's it's obvious they're born into tech. They're born into tech, and they're frequently cited as one of the most diverse generations we've seen. So um, mm -hmm. we're also seeing that they will, the millennials and Gen Z will take up more and more senior roles ultimately. And so, what should talent acquisition leaders consider when they strategize or they prepare to hire Gen Z today? What does Gen Z look for? Yeah, you know, in short, Gen Z wants the same as what their older millennial sisters and brothers wanted, which is the same thing as what people of my generation, Gen Xers wanted, which is the same thing as what baby boomers wanted. They want to be paid fairly. They want to be treated well. And at the end of the day, if you as an employer have a job that people are interested in and you treat them well and you pay them fairly, you're going to find people, the best candidates are going to want to work for you and they're going to want to stay with you. The employers that are really struggling the most hmm. are those that have a history of either treating their employees really poorly or paying them really poorly or often both. And then they're shocked at why people don't want to work for them and why they have a high turnover. So the difference that I think we see with Gen Z versus millennials, Gen X, and boomers is that Gen Z is more courageous and they are more into social justice. Hmm. They are prepared to give up money and live in a less affluent style in order to leave this world a better place. And older generations are, and I'm part of one of those generations, but we're more selfish. And uh, and it's I don't think it's a difference between my generation, you know, basically being in our 40s and 50s versus Gen Z being in our 20s. When my generation was in our 20s, we weren't as prepared to take less. I think that Gen Z doesn't want to take less. I think that they've accepted that they are going to have less. And if you're not going to be able to afford a house, if you're not going to be able to afford um, or to be able to live as affluent a lifestyle as your parents or grandparents, you start to look for other ways of living a fulfilling life. 
And so experiences matter more than things. Mm. Traveling means more. And stuff like that means that you want to work less, fewer hours. You want more vacation or leave time. You might work for three, four, five months, save up some money, quit, go travel for a month, come back, work for three, four, five months. And that's frustrating for employers. Mm. But you know what? The employees don't owe the employer anything. They don't, no employer should just expect that candidates should show up at their doorstep eager to work. You know, the 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 mid 1800s and the industrial revolution and, and slavery is long in the past. If you want people to come to work for you and to stay working for you, it's two, it's it's basically boils down to two variables. Pay them fairly, treat them well. And it's easier than ever to find out which organization treats their employees uh, well oh, and which yeah. ones don't, especially <laughs> when you have so many sites to to get that information from. Yeah. Right? Go, yeah. Just get just go to Google and type in the name of a company and type in, you know, bad review <laughs> or you know, awful boss or something like that. And it's real easy to find them. I mean, it, and and the fact that you have one disgruntled employee out there trash talking your organization is really not a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got um, the vast majority of people have left on good terms, at least they're not not trash talking you. You're you're fine. So don't sweat it if with one person has a bad experience and leaves. It's like a restaurant. You know, if you're going to go and go to a restaurant in a lot of areas of the world, people will go to Yelp to see what the reviews are. Mm -hmm. And if you see 900 reviews and 890 of them are a perfect five star, you don't really care what the other 10 said. You know, and Google has reviews for loads of businesses, not just restaurants. And it's the same thing. Glassdoor, Mm -hmm. Indeed. Uh, all, you know, lots of these sites have that information out there. And and also sal- salaries are becoming transparent now. Mm-hmm. There's a wave hitting the US, um, Canada, uh, the EU, and some other areas of the world where employers are legally required to share their salary ranges. Mm-hmm. And so it's becoming harder and harder for the employers who are underpaying to hide that. It's 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 right out there in the open. And as you said earlier, the Gen Z looking for more intangible benefits, perhaps more flexibility, more value uh, to their lifestyle in terms of their career even, and and how to bring those two together. Um, And across the board, even post-pandemic and moving into 2023 and plenty of changes to work arrangements. We have hybrid, we have um, the gig workforce, we have plenty of ways to describe it, but there's a greater demand for overall wellness and maybe autonomy even over work arrangements. Mm -hmm. So from an employer's perspective, what are some ways that organizations can position themselves as being appealing employers to college Mm -hmm. grads today? Well, great question. And, And let me pick up on a word that you just used, wellness. So at College Recruiter, we believe strongly in that. Like, Every other employer where our workers were mostly knowledge-based, and for for us, all of our workers were knowledge-based, we didn't have an office that people went into during COVID. Hmm. Now, unlike most employers, we've been fully remote since 1997. So there was no panic and do people have suitable places to work and do they have a computer and do they have, you know, high-speed internet and is it reliable and do they have, you know, kids or pets that are going crazy when they're trying to work? We didn't have those issues because we had already sort of dealt with that in part of the hiring process. But we all had the same mental struggles, physical struggles, the same stresses, the same sick relatives, probably all of our employees, I don't even remember, but probably all of us have had COVID at one time or another, or at least thought we did. So we've gone through the same issues. And one of the things that we did, um, because last year was was um, a really good year, the best year in, in our company's business, even though we were sort of starting to come out of COVID. Mm-hmm. It's hard to remember, but last year, 2021, was when we were starting to get vaccinated. Seems like a lot longer ago to most of us, but it was just it was just like spring of 2021 in 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 a lot of areas of the world and and even into the fall in some others. 
we decided going into the American Thanksgiving mm -hmm. week, um, which is the biggest holiday of the year in the US, um, late November, that instead of giving all of our employees um, the Thursday off, which is Thanksgiving Day, and then also Friday off, which we had for years so that they would get a four day weekend, we were also going to give everybody else also Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So everybody got nine successive days off. We all had our voicemails changed, our email autoresponders set that basically said, we're off for a wellness week. If there's an emergency, text this number. Not a single vendor, partner, or customer texted us uh, because there weren't any emergencies. We had prepared them in advance. And hey, touch wood, nothing weird happened. When we looked at that, and then when the employees came back, basically right at the very end of November and into December, everybody was noticeably recharged, refreshed, full of energy, drive, determination. And we finished the year like a rocket ship. And it carried over into January. We started to have some discussions at our, at our annual meeting early in 2022. And I said, you know, why don't we do a monthly wellness day? Hmm. We'll try to tie it in with a holiday so that instead of getting a three-day weekend, you get a four-day weekend. Or if there are going to be a lot of people traveling to a conference or something like that, we'll tie it in there um, to kind of minimize disruption. And so every single month, we have a we have a wellness day where the entire company shuts down. Voicemails change, emails change. If there's an emergency, text us. And I'll tell you, it has been a fantastic recruitment tool and a fantastic mm -hmm. retention tool. To add 12 days of vacation or leave to people a year is huge. You know, we have employees with little kids. This mm -hmm. is a day that they can take their little kids to a, to a park and not have to be thinking, oh, I've also got to the grocery store. I've also got to do this at all. So it really improves people's quality of life. If, if another employer were to come to one of our employees and say, hey, come to work for us, I suspect one of the first questions is going to be, do you have monthly wellness days? Mm -hmm. The answer is going to be no from the employer. And so the answer is going to be no from our employee. No, I'm not interested in going to work for you. That really adds a lot to my life. So that's the kind of thing that employers should be doing, that it doesn't cost anything. In fact, we see a positive return because when people come back from that day off, they're more productive. They're getting more done in less time. And, and what a win-win that is. That's just not, and that's not unique to just Gen Z. It's universal for everybody. Right. Everyone needs Absolutely. Yeah, they, those are Absolutely. A great example. Uh, Stephen, thanks for sharing. The talent teams that are bringing these new graduates, perhaps, perhaps these are the ones who are more eager to look for, for these from the get-go. So as talent teams, bring new graduates into the companies, they also need to play a role in facilitating that transition, you know, from school to the world of work. And today, especially, we see a very unique time, maybe in the past six to seven years, I'd say, a, a unique time in which we see so many generations within the workforce at the same time. So how might leaders, maybe some tips, how might leaders create a culture where Gen Z can, can smoothly assimilate and also thrive in a company? Yeah. So one of the things that sort of by definition, Gen Z is, is the youngest generation in the workforce now, which means that generally they have the least experience. They're the newest to the workforce. Now, there are definitely people who are 40, 50 years old who have never been in the workforce and now they're entering for the first time. They're, they're outliers though. Right. So generally, people who are new to the workforce are going to be the youngest. And that right now is Gen Z. And what that means, too, is that they need more training. Mm -hmm. They need coaching, mentoring. They need opportunities for advancement laid out in very concrete terms. So if you're looking to recruit and retain Gen Z, offer them in, in very easy to understand language, the opportunity to see that you actually care about their career advancement. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have a mentor, we're gonna be doing job coaching. This is what your training looks like. You're gonna work in this department for six months and then we're gonna move you over to that department for six months. 
and then that one for six and that one for six. And so at the end of two years, you'll have experienced our company in four different, very, four very different areas. You'll see what you like. We'll see what you're good at. And then we'll figure out together what the next step after that's going to be, you know, stuff like that. The training, the coaching, the mentoring, that the career pathing, hugely important. It blows me away when companies do two different things. Mm. One is no communication at all, despite having a very good plan. You know, mm. Lydia, we've got a great plan for you and you're going to get fantastic support, but for some reason, we're not going to tell you about it. And if we don't tell you about it, as far as you're concerned, it doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, you're going to leave. You have no reason to know that actually this is a great place to work. Your manager should sit down with you regularly, like go to lunch weekly, have a Zoom call once a month and just sort of find out what do you like? What don't you like? Let's try to get you more of what you like and less of what you don't like. It's not gonna be perfect, but let's try to maximize the goods and, and minimize the bads. The other, the other option or the other avenue, if you will, are the companies that it seems like they're purposely trying to hurt their retention. And hmm. they'll say to you things like, Lydia, we hired you to be a marketing associate. Whether you like it or not, whether you're good at it or not, until the end of time, you are going to be a marketing associate. And you just see you're locked in. And even if you loved it for two years, by the third year, you might want to do something different. And so you say to yourself, I've got to leave this company. If I don't leave this company, I'm going to be in this same job. I'm going to be in the same department forever. And I don't like it. I want something better. I think that that second group is where we see a lot of the turnover from um, in, during COVID. It's, those, it's the people who said there's more to life than this. I can leave and I can find a better job, a better life, a better opportunity elsewhere. And so they're voting with their feet. I see a lot of employers out there now complaining that there aren't any good candidates, that they can't hire anybody. And when I kind of look at them and scratch the surface and look back at how they were paying, what do their job postings look like? It's almost always very inwardly focused organizations. Mm -hmm. They're underpaying and their job postings reflect that they don't really care about their employees. The job postings are all about requirements. You have to have A, B, C, and D. And if you do, click here to apply. There's no compelling reason for the candidate to apply to the job posting ad. And I think it sends a very strong signal, especially to Gen Z, which is so web savvy. They read that, they understand what that means. And that even this company only cares about itself, not me. Communication for Gen Z is also very different. All of us use different platforms today to communicate. It's social. It's a lot more expressive. And perhaps they're looking out for something else in these job descriptions or job ads. So what goes into writing a, a solid job description that would appeal to a fresh grad? Yeah. I'm the co-host of a, of a podcast called the Inside uh, Job Boards and Recruitment Marketplaces podcast. I had the pleasure mm -hmm. recently of, of interviewing one of the world's experts on this, uh, Kat mm -hmm. Kibben uh, mm -hmm. with Three Years Media. And she just offers like really great practical advice. Mm -hmm. If the job ad is all about requirements, it's a terrible job ad. If the job ad is 2000 words long, nobody is going to read it. So when people look at job ads, the point of a job ad is the same as when you see a commercial on TV to buy a car or something substantial like that. It should not try to tell you everything about the car. And you as an employer should not try to tell the employee everything about the job. What you want to do is create interest, hmm. enough interest that the candidate clicks the apply button and applies. And at that point, the job ad is irrelevant. The job ad is different than the job description. So hmm. get take those 187 bullet points and get you know, boil it down to just the few that really matter, have at least as many benefits of working here. Hmm. And when you're talking about, as you do requirements, and when you're talking about att attracting Gen Z, 
understand that you're talking about 20-ish year olds who are in their minds probably 50 years away from being able to retire. So if your benefits are all about things that baby boomers care about, pensions in the US, 401ks, you got to understand a 20-year-old couldn't care less. And so you're you're just wasting ink. And you're also sending a signal to that person that you don't understand them. Mm. So focus on your employer brand value, your employer brand um, proposition, proposition and the EVP. And the way that I think Kat described it is talk to your best employees and ask them, When you woke up this morning and made the decision about whether or not to go to work, why did you choose to come to work? That is your employee value proposition. So some of them are going to say, I love the people. I come here and I just absolutely just love the people I work with. That's the EVP for that person. Other people might say, you pay me so much, I have to come to work. That's your EVP. Uh, Other people might say, this is the only place in town that I'm allowed to work at. Uh, You know, I'm an engineer and you're the only engineering company in town. Well, that's your EVP. Come to work for us. You can't work anywhere else. And so just, you know, really zero in on that and communicate that. That's interesting. I like how it's organic and it comes from inside. Where, where you take what yeah. people actually find appealing and it's it's authentic even and you, you put it back mm-hmm. out there and and what's appealing to one person might be definitely appealing to someone else who's looking towards joining a company perhaps so let's discuss technology Stephen we've spoken quite a bit mm. about Gen Z already and tech being a very uh, significant part of their life how might technology help in ensuring diversity in in hiring practices Yeah. So one thing is the broader the net that you cast, the more places that you're trying to attract candidates from, by definition, the more diverse that's going to be. So some of your listeners might be familiar with a company called AppCast. AppCast was a a company founded in the US, I don't know, probably eight, 10 years ago, um, acquired by Stepstone, the big German job board company, roughly five years ago, something like that. And it's a programmatic job ad distributor. Mm -hmm. So employers, job boards send postings to AppCast and they, they pay for the traffic they receive by the click, by the, pardon me, by the application. AppCast ran a study, um, I think it was during COVID, and to see how the postings performed across their network, all the different job boards that, that they send the postings to. In, in terms of diversity. Mm-hmm. And what they were a little surprised, but happy to see was that jobs that are um, advertised programmatically, whether it's through Jovio or AppCast or Panda Logic or JobAdX or any of those uh, vendors, about 17% more of the candidates are considered by the employer to be diverse. They, you know, in engineering, it might be female, might mm. be people of color, you know, whatever it is. Diversity means different things to different employers, even in even different roles. It can mean different things. Mm. And it's interesting to me because they don't know why. They mm. they can't they can't definitively say why the postings are more diverse, but they believe, and I think they're right, that it's simply because the postings are in more places mm. and different kinds of candidates use different kinds of sites. So if you only advertise your jobs on Indeed, you're only going to get candidates who use Indeed. And those candidates aren't going to be as diverse as if you also run those postings on LinkedIn and AdZuna and Dice and College Recruiter. You're just tapping into a more diverse group of people. So your applicant pool is, is going to reflect that. The other thing is, especially in the world of you know early talent, early careers, mm-hmm. when employers are going to schools is that when you only go to say 10, 20, 30 schools, all of your candidates are gonna reflect those schools. They have the same professors, they probably live in the same areas, they have the same socioeconomic mm-hmm. backgrounds. There is no diversity. But if you advertise that position online, 
In the US, there are 7,000 colleges and universities. So if you're an employer that's been used to going to 20 schools, and now you're essentially going to 7,000, which one is, do you think is going to be a more, more diverse applicant pool? And, and when you've widened the pool and you've, you've cast your net out there and you're seeing more and more people come in, obviously they're going to enter your, your organization and leaders and hiring mm -hmm. managers have to think about what they need to do in order to make sure that this diversity is included in the workspace. So as, as mm -hmm. you know, for, for leaders and hiring managers, what are some actionable steps that they can take to ensure diversity and inclusion in the workplace? Yeah. So, you know, a, a diverse workforce would be, you know, if basically you put a whole bunch of people in the room and you looked at their faces and you counted up how many white people there were and how many black people and how many Asians and how many female and how many male, right? That's going to be a measurement of diversity. And that has nothing to do with what they bring to the workplace. Mm. Because, you know, you're female, I'm male. Does that really mean anything in and of itself? No. But what is meaningful is that probably you bring a different way of looking at things mm. than I do. You get the two of us together working on a problem. There's diversity there. And we're probably going to come up with a better solution. One of our um, clients is a central intelligence agency. They And one of their um, former talent acquisition leaders spoke at a, at a conference we had. And she said that they ran actual data tests. They compared mm -hmm. the productivity of work teams that were diverse mm -hmm. versus those that weren't. Same problem, you know, how do we combat this terrorist cell in Afghanistan? You know, whatever it is, I'm just making that up. And the can the, the um, analyst teams that were more diverse consistently came up with better intelligence than those that weren't because they had different ways of looking. They saw different things. In the workplace, when you can tap into that, when you can make people feel like you're welcome here, you're part of the team, you're not just here as a token female, right? Now you're talking about inclusion. Mm -hmm. And when you do things like, you know what, Lydia, you're female, I'm male, we're doing the same job, we're gonna get paid the same. Now you're talking about equity. So if you are paid, like unfortunately most females are, average females are, about a third less than what I am, simply because I have an extra chromosome, right? that is not equitable. So if you want to recruit and retain diverse candidates, you need to pay attention to the mm. equity and you need to pay attention to the inclusion. If it's just putting a photo up on some billboard, look how diverse we are. Mm. And it's probably stock photography. I guarantee you, you're going to be left with a whole bunch of white dudes. What advice would you give today to someone who's starting out in recruitment? Someone who's starting out in recruitment should stay away from sourcing. So, you know, for those who are really new, they might not even know the difference. Sourcing, it has different definitions. The way I think about it is when you are finding a candidate and presenting an opportunity to the candidate that they're not aware of yet. A recruiter is usually somebody who is talking to a candidate who has already expressed interest. They might have come to an open house, a career fair, they might have applied to a job. The problem with sourcing, when you're going to say LinkedIn and searching for people with maybe certain degrees and years of experience who live in certain metro areas, and then you're sending them in mails, mm -hmm. um, LinkedIn's version of an email. That's kind of a very normal sourcing process. It's highly repetitive. And the reality is the vast majority of that work is pretty low skilled. It's kind of the same thing over and over again. I'm not saying that sourcers lack skill or that they that there's not a lot of creativity in that field. What I am saying is that the bulk of the hours put in by most sourcers, a lot more of it is on the grunt work than it is on the sort of the creativity, the knowledge that they bring. And that's ripe for automation, probably mm. through AI. So if a typical sports sorcerer spends an hour a day, like 
really thinking, really being savvy, really being creative. And then the other seven hours of the day, click, paste, send, click, paste, send. AI is going to take seven of those hours away from you. Yes. So if you're the one left with the job, that's great because you're going to have eight hours of creative work. But what it does mean is that for every eight sourcers, seven of them are going to disappear. I think that is right upon us. I, I, I think in two years, you're going to see a fraction of the sorcerers that you see now. Ultimately, it is about um, automating the tasks that you do that don't add value to your overall hiring strategy and, and just look for automation. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think for every job lost in sourcing, the good news is I think that there's at least one job being added in branding um, and, and mm. other forms of talent attraction. Candidate relationship management, CRM mm -hmm. systems um, are, are rapidly gaining favor where you're nurturing, you're sending a series of customized emails to candidates over a long period of time to sort of warm them up and convince them to raise their hand and say, you know what, when you started emailing me 19 months ago, I wasn't ready, but my kids just went to school. Now I can look for a full-time job. When, do, when can I start, right? That is awesome programmatic cost per click if you're good with math the world is your oyster and and actually i think a lot of sorcerers their talent is mm. kind of math driven they're mm. playing the odds they're the good sorcerers know where to spend their time implicitly it's a math decision what's the probability that if i spend an hour on linkedin versus indeed that i'm going to find the candidate and that at the end of the day is is what programmatic and and, and performance-based advertising is it's playing the odds it's it's math well thank you very much for your time today Stephen. I, I really enjoyed this conversation it's a whole breadth of uh, topics that we covered today and the listeners might be very intrigued to know where they can find you so where can they connect with you yeah easy if if they want information about college recruiter go to www.collegerecruiter.com and if they want to connect with me shoot me an email Stephen at collegerecruiter.com. Lydia, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Stephen. And we have been in conversation with Stephen Rothberg, founder of College Recruiter in the United States. If you like our content, please subscribe to our channels and stay tuned for more weekly episodes of All in Recruitment.